Let me invite you now to open your Bibles to the book of Titus, which is hiding in your New Testament. If you uh, like to use a pew Bible, they're in the pews in front of you, page 999. If you'd like to download a Bible on your phone, go for it right now. In the pew Bible, page 999. It's where it is. It's a short book, Titus, but it has an incredible Christmas verse in it, and I want to draw your attention to it tonight. It's Titus 3, verse 4, and then just the first three words of verse 5. We'll read that sentence, Titus 3, verse 4, written by the Apostle Paul. He says this, when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared. He saved us. I want to tell you my favorite Santa Claus story. Not the Scandinavian Santa Claus. Not that one. It's about a Middle Eastern Santa Claus. From Asia Minor, 325 AD was the year. Long before there were brick chimneys. This Santa Claus, St. Nicholas, his name was actually just simply Nicholas. Later on, he'd be canonized by the Catholic Church and dubbed St. Nicholas. He was a pastor and an author in that time period who wrote much about Christianity. He argued about the centrality of Jesus Christ, about the importance of believing in Jesus Christ. This is an age, if you're familiar with that fourth century. This is an age where, uh, in some senses, Christianity was growing in the world. Constantine was the emperor. He is allegedly the first Christian emperor. Uh, Christianity was growing in that part of the world, but Christianity was declining in the western part of the empire. The Visigoths and the barbarians were beginning to invade, and Rome was going to be threatened soon enough, and North Africa was going to fall after that. And, but for this brief moment, kind of the zenith of Christianity in the Roman Empire with Constantine is the emperor. Nicholas was one of the more well-known pastors. Uh, He spoke Greek, Nicholas. It's got a Greek flair to it. Um, And uh, wrote many books about why you needed to believe in Jesus Christ. And Constantine ended persecution of Christianity and called the pastors of the Roman Empire together to kind of hash out what theology was going to be, to hash out, you know, Constantine, the emperor, wanted to be in control of what churches could, could teach, and any doctrine that went against what, what he okayed, the, that pastor could be punished, and exiled was their famous form of punishment, and so that was the council there, and there was another man named Arius who was there, and Arius was giving a speech about who was born on Christmas morning. Arius was addressing all the pastors there, and um, It had yet to be called Christmas morning, but he was talking about when the incarnation happened and Mary gave gave birth. Arius recognized that it was a virgin birth, and Eric recognized uh, Arius recognized that it was a supernatural and a miraculous birth, and uh, unlike any other birth the world had ever seen. But he also made a big point that it was not divine; that the child that was born there in Bethlehem, three hundred and twenty five years ago from that point, was not in fact God born to man, but was someone different, perhaps a more exalted than other people, perhaps you could even call him the firstborn over all creation, he was was more exalted than most, Arius said, but certainly not God come to earth. Well, while Arius was talking, the crowd was quiet, and I don't know how many people were there. Some people say 500. There's a painting of this at the Bible Museum, but the painting was made a thousand years later. I don't know how accurate it is. While he was talking, Nicholas rose up from his seat on Arius' left and on the side of the room over there and walked across the room to the stairs, having to walk across in front of the emperor, across in front of the emperor and the, you know, the main guard there, and up the opposing stairs, and then back across the stage, and uh, Nicholas was known, and so I, I don't know if they had secret service then, but nobody stopped him. And while Arius was talking about why it could not have been God that was born there in that major 325 years earlier, Nicholas arrived at the pulpit and with his right hand punched him in the face. 
and then return to his seat. That was his rebuttal. That is St. Nicholas. So just know that when you teach your kids about St. Nicholas, that's... (laughs) You're instilling them the importance of the deity of Christ, that's for sure. (laughs) Does raise this question, though, who was born that Christmas morning? You know the story. I read it from Matthew earlier. The, The children read it on the screen earlier in Luke chapter 2 that the uh, virgin, it was a supernatural birth that Mary had never been uh, with a man and yet she gave birth. The shepherds stopped what they were doing to go and and worship this baby. The angels stopped what they were doing to come down to earth and worship. They proclaimed glory to God in the highest, peace on earth among those with whom he's well pleased. I mean, the angels are worshiping because of this baby. Angels are familiar with worship. They dwell in the the realm of of God. Angels know who you are allowed to worship, namely God, and who you're not allowed to worship, everyone else. (laughs) And here they are, worshiping as a result of this baby's birth, directing the shepherds to go quickly and see. The wise men journeyed far to go see this baby, bringing him gifts. This is unusual, to say the least. My three daughters are very cute, but wise men did not traverse from afar, bringing them gifts. It's not too late, though. I'm still accepting them. (laughs) Herod, who had the king who was reigning over that part of the world, uh, wanted to put this baby to death, so he executed countless babies trying to get the right one, who was snuck away to Egypt at the last moment, sparing his life. I mean, this is an unusual circumstance. So the question that Arius asked and that Nicholas answered with his fist (laughs) is an important question. Who exactly was born that morning in Bethlehem? I want to give you three answers from this verse, Titus 3, verse 4. First, I'm going to say that holiness was born. Holiness was born that morning. It says in verse 4, but when the goodness of God our Savior appeared. That word goodness is an important word. It speaks of moral virtue. This is the same word that is used in the book of Romans when it says, speaking of people, that no one is good, no not one. I know that you think you know good people and our standard for good is so contorted. We say that somebody is good because they do simply less evil than other people we can think of. We think that we're good because we always do what's right according to ourselves. <laughs> so the logic breaks down pretty quickly there. But the Bible says that no one is good, no, not even one. And that here in this passage, it says that Jesus, when he was born that morning, when, the, when our God and our Savior appeared, when he entered stage left and walked onto the scene, when he was born that morning, it's fair to say that it was goodness incarnate, God's moral virtue incarnate, God's holiness in human flesh. And this really is our problem that the Bible says without holiness, no one can see the Lord. The Bible says that God is perfectly holy and that our sin separates us from God, that God, because he's a good judge, must punish sin and punish iniquity, and we have much of it to go around. And so because God is holy and, and righteous, he will punish sin. And because we're not holy and we have no innate goodness in ourselves, we can't reach out back to God. Now, of course, people do good things all the time. When the Bible says no one is good, it's speaking of your, your moral character, speaking of your identity. But it doesn't say nobody can do good. Lots of people do good. People do good all the time. When you help other people out, when you, when you follow the laws, when you conscientiously object to the laws. I mean, there's all kinds of ways you can do good. When you help an old lady cross at the stoplight right there and not get hit on her way to Starbucks from church between services, you're doing something good. People do good all the time, but notice the the difference is we do good when our actions conform to a standard that's outside of us, namely the God standard. So you do good when you do things that conform to God's standard, but you can't do enough good to make you good. Does that make sense? Can the Ethiopian change his skin? Can the leopard change his spots? Can you do enough good to make yourself good? And the answer is, is no. Scrub as he might, the, 
the leopard cannot take off those spots. <laughs> he is who he is. You can do good all day long and all night long also, and it won't make you a good person because your motives are conflicted. You have sin resident in your heart. You're separated from God because of your sin. That is our basic problem. And that's true of everybody who has ever been born in every nation, in every country, in every time. Except for Adam when he was made and Eve when they were made. They were made without indwelling sin. But they sinned. And when they sinned, they became corrupted and they passed on their corruption to all of us. And then the other exception of that is Jesus. And that's where you see this right here. When the goodness of God our Savior appeared. Jesus did not have Adam's sin because of the virgin birth. It was not passed down to him because he didn't have a human father. So he alone is actually good. And what's interesting about this is as Jesus does good things throughout his life, he's not doing good things because they conform to a standard outside of himself. He is in himself good. He is the definition then of good. You remember those WWJD bracelets, some of you? What would Jesus do bracelets back in the day? What would Jesse do bracelets? <laughs> I convinced my kids is what they stand for. Don't, don't tell them otherwise. What's interesting about Jesus is what he does defines goodness very different than anybody else. You can have a role model or a mentor or a teacher or a coach that you respect or something like that, somebody who gives you advice and discipleship in life. They're pointing you to a standard outside of themselves. You know, they're good and they're godly and they're older and they're wiser, but they're pointing to another standard and they're saying you should live according to that standard, not the way Jesus lived. Jesus himself was the standard. Now, of course, he kept God's commands and he kept God's law because he himself is, is God. But that's not where Paul focuses here in this, this verse. Paul's not identifying yet the deity of Christ. Right here in the beginning of the verse, he's identifying just the moral goodness of Jesus. That morning when he appeared, he was perfectly holy, perfectly righteous, and our problem is that we're not. And so even when you're doing good, it's to something outside of you, and here along comes Jesus who is goodness. Who was born that morning? Goodness was born. Holiness was born taking on a human nature, robing himself in flesh. When Jesus came to earth, he never set aside anything that he had before. All of his glory, all of his power, and in this instance, all of his holiness, he veiled it, he possessed it, but he veiled it in human flesh, adding on another nature, adding on a human nature, but that human nature un tainted by sin, radiant in holiness and purity because Jesus was goodness incarnate. There's no one good, no, not even one, but there is Jesus Christ. He is goodness. Second, not just that morning was holiness born, but second, and the word I'm going to use is philanthropy was born. Philanthropy. Because you see an interesting verse here, an interesting word, when the goodness and loving kindness, it's two words in your English translation, loving kindness, it's one word in the, the Greek, and the, the Greek word, you're going to love this, you're going to learn this Greek word right now. The Greek word is philanthropy. <laughs> Neat that the English and the Greek line up there. I mean, why not? See, you learned something tonight. Philanthropy was born. What philanthropy is, if you, if you don't know that word, it's this desire to give good things, to, to give of yourself. Think of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, giving away $36 billion so far. That's insane. Last year gave away almost $5 billion in one year, giving it away. That's philanthropy. And one of the questions that people always ask is, why did God create the world? And the answer the Bible gives you is that God created the world to share his glory, to give away his glory, to make himself known to people. Now, a non-Christian might hear that and think, you know, how, how arrogant must God be that he needs to make people to worship him? And you just, you have it all wrong if you think that. It's not that God is arrogant and needs to make people to worship him. It's that God is generous and he makes people to receive his generosity. No one would look at Bill and Melinda Gates and say, oh, how, how arrogant must they be? They think they're helping people by giving their money away. Come on. Just spend it on yourself there, Bill Gates. God makes the world so that he can give 
himself away. Of course, infinite in his riches, infinite in his treasure, infinite in his holiness. He gives those things to us and he's none the poorer for them. He doesn't run out. He possesses them infinitely, but he shares them with us. Now, this is true of all of creation. God makes all of the universe for us to enjoy and us to delight. He makes all of the universe for us to live in and dwell from sunrises to sunsets to to marriage to steak. He makes so many things for us to enjoy. It's on my list, okay? It doesn't need to be on yours, but it's on mine. He's so generous now he makes the world. But that's, those things are, everybody enjoys those things. That's not the extent of his generosity. Beyond that, he has a special love for those who are in Christ, for those who believe in the birth of Jesus Christ and in the life and the death of Jesus Christ, who put their faith in him. There's a special kind of, of philanthropy that they receive. They receive the knowledge of God. They receive a relationship with him. Remember, if your sin separates you from God, you can't be in a relationship with God. And there's nothing you can do to make yourself good enough to have this relationship. So God comes to you. He brings this relationship to you. And now because he comes to you, you receive a second benefit. Those apart from Christ can experience all the good things in the world that he places in the world, but they also experience the sin and the suffering in the world as well. But those who are in Christ, they experience the sin and the suffering in the world. They experience the goodness in the world, and they experience something additional. They experience the personal relationship, a personal nature that comes from God. They're invited into a relationship with God. They receive him, is the language the Bible uses. Now, God is philanthropic. He made the world to give himself away and that's seen most of all in Christ. How selfless Christ was. That he lived his life for others. He lived his life keeping God's commands, of course. But he also lived his life for the benefit of others. Jesus didn't exercise his holiness. He didn't do all the things the Bible commanded him to do for his own gain. He did it for others. Our gainer, as the scripture says, for God so loved the world, he gave his only son. The object here is, uh, is the world that, whom God loves. And the act is he gives his son. And his son lives this selfless life. The result of his life is that you now have a way to approach him. You could never work your way to God. You could never be good enough to give, get to God. You could never be rich enough to buy his favor. If you think of it this way, you can't do enough good things to approach God. You can't purchase access to God either. But he comes to you and gives you his goodness in Jesus Christ and then he comes to you and shares with you his glory. Shares with you for the forgiveness that he can dispense. He gives to you through Jesus Christ. This is what Paul means when he says the goodness and the philanthropy or the loving kindness is how it gets rendered in English. The loving kindness of God appeared. Now the appearing here the word appeared there, the last word in this, this verse. It speaks of his birth, of course. It speaks of when he was born in that manger in Bethlehem that Christmas night. He was born to save people from their sins. He was born to be holiness. He was born to be goodness incarnate. And of course, his birth doesn't save anyone. His birth speaks of his life, his sinless life. His life doesn't save anyone. His life points to his death. His death on the cross. His death wouldn't save anybody were it not for the resurrection. So think about how this package works together. Jesus' goodness, holiness, and philanthropy and human flesh. You want to know what God's holiness and what his philanthropy looks like? If it were a person, it's Jesus. Now he leads leads a, a sinless life, doing all the things that you and I could not do, keeping all the commands that you and I could not keep were they given to us doing everything that holiness requires because he is holiness. And he's doing this on our behalf. The song we sang earlier called him the true and better Adam. What that means by that is that Adam failed to obey God's command. Jesus never failed. He was the better Adam in that sense. And he did it all for us. Now at the end of his life, he's crucified. He's nailed to death on the cross. And that's in our place for our sins. So our sins become placed on him as his righteousness and goodness is shared then with us. So he suffers in our place, dying our death, which he could do because he was sinless. A sinful person couldn't die for somebody else. 
Only a sinless person can die under God's holiness for somebody else's sins. And that's exactly what Jesus does. And that death wouldn't mean anything were it not for his resurrection. Rising from the grave on the third day later to demonstrate to the world that death could not slay ultimately the author of life, that sins were paid for. You want to know that how you know the death of Jesus actually paid for all your sins? Because he's not still dead. When you pay off a car, you get the title in the mail. The first time I paid off a, a car in my life, the car that I bought foolishly at one moment in time, I was able to pay it off 10 years later or something ridiculous. <laughs> and the bank didn't send me the title. And I got nervous. I had to walk there and walked there, ironically. It wasn't that far from my house. <laughs> and say, hey, we're missing something here. <laughs> Eventually, they sent me the title. Yes, my car. How do you know the death of Jesus was sufficient to pay for all of your sins? Because he's not still in the grave. He's, the title deed has been released. He's been resurrected. Sins have been paid for. And all these the first three words he saved us. This is the third point. Holiness was born that day. Philanthropy was born that day. Finally, salvation was born that day. Salvation was born that day. By Jesus coming to earth, he is our salvation. There's no salvation apart from Jesus Christ. There's no way to be saved except by putting your faith in him. As the verse goes on to say, not because of works done in righteousness, but according to his own mercy by the washing of regeneration and the renewal of the Holy Spirit. That's how he saved us. He saved us not by us working our way to heaven. He saved us by a gift. I mean, if you're a parent and your baby is born and you hold your, your new baby, you're overcome with emotion and there's nothing your child can do at that moment to earn your love, right? It's gonna be at least four years before they can do the laundry by themselves. <laughs> at that point, they're only needy but they have your love. This becomes the model for how you love Christ. There's nothing you can do to earn his love. You don't have the capacity to earn the love of Christ. It's given to you freely, conditionally through faith in Jesus Christ. This is the appearance of Christ on the stage. Holiness was born that day. Philanthropy was born that day. Salvation was born that day. Demonstrating that Jesus is innocent, Jesus is God incarnate. Of course he's God incarnate. Of course he's God that's born there. Who else can be holiness? Who else can be the, the philanthropic nature of God except God himself? Who else could be the light of God except the very light of God? Who else could be the word of God except God eternal? And he's the worker. He does all the work for salvation. God's goodness is seen in his law that tells us how to live, but his kindness is seen in the gospel, and both of which are born that morning in Bethlehem. The law in human flesh, the gospel in human flesh, grace in human flesh, truth in human flesh, salvation in human flesh. Apart from Christ, there is no way to be saved. If he was only a man born that day, a man cannot save you from your sin and you would be lost. If you're here tonight and you've never placed your faith in Jesus Christ, I pray that you would tonight, that tonight would be the moment that you realize that the person born that morning in Bethlehem, these three fancy words, just a way to say that God was born, <laughs> that God took on human flesh and came to earth. We're lost in the darkness of our night, but Jesus shines into our light. He comes into our world, opens up our hearts, restores our spirit, and through faith in him gives us eternal life. Let me pray for you all. Lord, we're thankful that you are a giver by nature. In eternity past, you've given life to your son, the Lord Jesus Christ. In eternity past, you have given your word to him. And now in time, your, your light and your word have put on human flesh. Lord, we know that you are a savior by nature. It's in your nature to extend salvation to those of us on the earth. We want to receive your salvation through Jesus Christ by putting our faith in the baby born in Bethlehem that night. We give you thanks for this in Jesus' name. Amen. 
You have been listening to Emmanuel with Pastor Jesse Johnson. You can find more resources like this at ibcva.com. Here is a parting word from Pastor Jesse. If you have any questions about what you heard today, or if you want to learn more about what it means to follow Christ, please visit our church website, ibcva.com. If you're not a member of a local church and you live in the Washington, D.C. area, we'd love to have you worship with us here at Emmanuel. We're located in Northern Virginia, and for more information about when and where we worship, check out our church website. I hope to personally meet you this Sunday after our service. But no matter where you live, it's our hope that everyone who uses this resource is involved in their own local church. Now may God bless you this week as you seek Jesus constantly, serve the Lord faithfully, and share the gospel boldly.